Over the course of six webinars, library associations from countries in each IFLA regional division will present opportunities they provide for new and senior librarians, including leadership opportunities and how these library associations are fostering diversity within the library profession and leadership. The webinar format includes interactive opportunities to engage attendees in conversations about those topics that will elicit best practices and recommendations and the needs for new and senior professionals. The insights gained from these webinars will then inform and enrich the MLIS open session for the 2022 IFLA World Library and Information Congress in Dublin, which will focus on the same theme. This webinar series is connected to the EFLA strategy three, connect and empower the field, specifically 3.2, support virtual networking and connections, and 3.3, empower the field at the national and regional level. Next slide. Our agenda today includes library associations sharing their resources about leadership and diversity, interactive conversations. Attendees, please join an interactive meeting room. Then we return to the main webinar room to hear from seasoned and veteran librarians uh, new to leadership, sharing information about their experiences and path to leadership. I would like to thank Hello Locker, uh, chair of MLAS and each one of the members of the MLAS webinars working group for their time to coordinate the webinars and for supporting these efforts. Big thanks as well to the IFA New Professional Special Interest Group and their convener, Magdalena Gomulka, for supporting the webinar technical aspects and so many logistics, uh, including the interactive rooms today. Your collaboration is valued. Before we continue, next slide, please turn off your microphone and camera during presentations. Note that this meeting is being recorded. And now I would like to ask Magdalena Gomolka, convener of IFLA New Professionals to join us for a special section. Yeah, uh, thank you, Loida, for introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Magdalena. And uh, there is a part that we would like to know uh, from uh, which countries are you. And uh, so we prepare a short uh, task. Uh, please go to uh, menti.com website and use this code four two twelve eleven ninety two, or just only, uh, you know, take a photo of this, uh, of this uh, QR code and we will see and uh, how many from which countries are you. So now I will stop sharing our presentation and show you uh, our results from the from the Jamboard uh, from the Mentimeter sorry okay. Sure. Yes. yes, so uh, all countries which you uh, write down in Mentimeter, uh, you will see that uh, there are there on, on this slide. So you have uh, one minute to do that, and then we will see. Um, who are with us. Yeah, uh, changing. So uh, we have uh, United States, Poland, Lebanon, Canada, Jamaica, Croatia, Austria, India, Germany, Puerto Rico, Eastern Long Island, New York. Oh, it's changing <laughs> so quickly. So that's, that's, thank you that you are writing. Uh, every time. Mm -hmm. So a few seconds for that, and we can we can go further. 
Oh, and Marcin, yeah, I see. So uh, many countries, uh, all continents, I guess. Uh, so thank you for joining uh, our webinar and that, uh, that you are with us. Oh. Thank you, Magdalena. That was beautiful. Yeah. I yeah. like this activity. And now okay. we are pleased to have and welcome Barbara Leeson, IFLA president, bringing opening remarks for our webinar series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will share my screen. Dear colleagues in the library world, in the global library world, I'm happy to have the opportunity to welcome you to the new webinar series Empowering Library Leaders and Diversity Worldwide. This is a wonderful cooperation between the section IFLA Management of Library Associations and the special interest group IFLA New Professionals. The combination of library associations and the interests of the new professionals is wonderful because you, the new professionals, you are our future. So this cooperation is a great thing and I think IFLA is very happy that we have Loida Garcia Febo, who is the person who is the mediator between these two sections or the one section and the special interest group. The goal of the seminar and the webinar is to exchange experience. Experience from the professional work, of course, in order to foster diversity within the library professional leadership. And I would like to come back to the leadership a bit later. So you will have interactive opportunities to discuss best practice and show how diversity comes to leadership and leadership is connected with diversity. As a contribution for MLAS Open Session in the World Library and Information Congress 2021, this will be a very valuable contribution to our Congress in Dublin in July of this year. I would like to talk about leadership just a little bit. What is a leader? Of course, we have different opinions of a leadership political leadership, professional leadership, but now let's talk about professional leadership and also the personalities who show good leadership. What makes a good leader? I think a good leader makes empathy, empathy for the profession, intrinsic motivation, and also, of course, empathy for people, empathy for persons. A leader also is a communicator, of course. He or she should communicate their goals, communicate their mission to the people who are responsible, who are the decision makers. Very, very important. And, of course, a leader is someone who has more questions than answers and establish uh, goals and have plans for the future. St a strategic thinker. Leaders are strategic thinkers. And, of course, you should also build up self-confidence as a leader, but also be genuine as a personality. And you should follow successful examples. And with these seminars and webinars, you have the opportunity to follow successful examples from all over the world with the question, what makes a good leader and how can diversity implement it in good leadership? So I wish you many insights and a successful participation in the webinars. And thank you for all who have organized, who are contributing to the webinars. I'm really happy that we have this. So let's start with the webinars. All the best. We are IFLA. And thank you so much again to Barbara Lisa and IFLA president for um, sending the wonderful remarks for our webinar series. Our speakers today, and we're going to go to the next slide, are Patricia Patty Wong. Perfect. And she is the city librarian of Santa Clara, California. Wong is the president of the American Library Association, ALA, 
for the 2021-2022 term and is the first Asian American president of the ALA. She has been on the faculty of the uh, San Jose State University High School since 2006, teaching equitable access to library services, library management, and library services to young people. We also have Crystal Chen. She is the Teen Center Coordinator at the New York Public Library and a 2018 ALA Emerging Leader. She received her MS LIS from Pratt Institute and is an active member of the Chinese American Librarians Association and Asian Pacific American Librarians Association. She also serves as a community admin for We Here, a supportive community for Black, Indigenous, and persons of color, BIPOC, in LIS. We have Ms. Susan E. Clyde, is the former Dean of Libraries at Memorial University, Newfoundland, and Labrador in Canada. Ms. Clyde is currently the chair of the Partnership, the Network of Provincial, Regional, and Territorial Library Associations of Canada the Vice President for the Atlantic Provinces Library Association, APLA, and the Visiting Program Officer uh, for Leadership Development for the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. And our last speaker, wonderful, Dr. Celinda Berg, started her term as University Librarian at the University of Windsor in July 2021. Dr. Berg leads an exceptional team who meaningfully contribute to the academic mission of the university and to the success of students and faculty. Dr. Berg holds a master and doctoral degree in library and information studies, as well as a bachelor of science in nutrition. In 2019, Dr. Berg received the award of merit from the Canadian Association of Research Libraries in recognition of her sustained leadership in building research capacity within Canada's academic library community. Now it is um, my pleasure to welcome our first speaker. And we're going to go into our first section. Um, and this is of library associations speaking about leadership opportunities and how they are fostering diversity. Welcome, Patty Wong. Thank you, Loida. And, uh... Welcome to everyone, and what a, what a wonderful um, beginning uh, greetings from, from Dr. Barbara Leeson, because leadership and equity and our opportunities actually to share stories and to learn from one another is so wonderful. Um, Magda, can we start with the slides, please? Thank you. Uh, yes, yes. And thank you very much to, to Magda and for Lloyda for the generous um, invitation today. I, as And warm greetings from the American Library Association. I happen to be sitting in Portland, Oregon right now, and it's about 7 a.m. So greetings from you for all, from all over the world. Wonderful to see everyone here today. <clears throat> Next slide, please. I'd like to begin by sharing what the American Library Association is doing internally as well as externally with our community. And um, equity, diversity, and inclusion is so important to all of us. Um, but what, what we know to be true is that inclusion needs to also begin internally within the organization. We cannot do a, a good job with, um, with sharing uh, leadership practices in equity, diversity, and inclusion unless we look internally and, and we do the work um, uh, within the association. So in January 2022, um, our ALA governing structure, our council, adopted, approved the adoption of the diversity, equity, and inclusion, otherwise known as DEI, our scorecard for library and information organizations. We created that as a metric for both our internal uh, uh, temperature reading and pulse as an organization, as well as externally for our community as a whole. It was created by the Committee on Diversity and Office for Diversity, Literacy and Outreach Services, one of our uh, many uh, offices that we have to support our members. And it has five suggested scorecard measures. Um, they assist our community at large by looking at how EDI, <clears throat> Some people use EDI, some people use DEI. I've also heard IDE the other day. Um, how is EDI embedded into the culture and framework and climate of your organization? 
So there are metrics in which um, you can determine that. And we look at that through these five areas, um, through, um, through how it's embedded. Uh, we look at training and education. And that is, what do we do internally with our community to make sure that they have the tools and are prepared uh, for really advancing the EDI work within the association in this particular case? Um, we look at recruitment, hiring, retention, and promotion, because as we know, our staff are the key pillars of actually um, bringing that uh, influence and, and impact of EDI in our community. So, but it's also how we recruit, where we recruit, um, what kind of language do we use in our, um, in our job descriptions? Who are we approaching? Are we going through um, a very diverse uh, sets of, um, of, uh, of interest groups within our community? Um, have we changed the language uh, within our job descriptions to mirror uh, what we mean when we talk about um, effective EDI practices around recruitment? Um, within the hiring practice, what is the makeup of our, um, of our panels? What kinds of questions do we use um, in terms of our uh, evaluating? Our, um, our candidates? Um, do we encourage, um, do we look at that through an equity, diversity, and inclusion lens? And uh, do we ask questions about multicultural populations, multilingual services, how um, they have been able to use um, and influence that kind of programming uh, in their own opportunities? Um, have they worked within multicultural populations and are they familiar? Uh, with, the, with the resources and the outreach opportunities and what does engagement really with um, diverse populations really look like for them. Um, retention, how do you retain um, our, once we have our great staff on board, how do we make sure that we retain uh, all of that um, wonderful staff and, and talent um, and capacity um, and uh, appreciation and drive for um, equity, diversity, and inclusion? Um, how do we make sure that um, there's an environment that is welcoming, that is comfortable, that is safe, um, uh, where uh, people can have very strong, um, important conversations about differences and, and create allies in the work? And then um, lastly, how can we promote and advance um, all people, uh, but especially, um, people from diverse backgrounds um, who, who represent both the community that we're serving um, as well as diversity in itself. And how do we make sure that there's no ceiling uh, for, for individuals um, who are different from ourselves? Um, last, and the number four um, area is budget priorities for uh, DEI. What does that mean um, in that we have influence and impact and we can bring more funding and resources uh, to really accent, accent and elevate the DEI practices we have within the association. And then lastly, data practices. Are we collecting information about um, all of these areas um, so we can evaluate appropriately, so we can see that we're on the right track, um, so it's meaningful? And how can we share that data with our members um, so that they show, so we can share if evidence that this is working and that we have um, policies and uh, practice uh, in place uh, to support our work. Next slide, please. So with that inclusion as a baseline, uh, one of the things that we're doing is we have sort of a three-year cycle of processes uh, within the American Library Association, and we're looking systemically at how we can um, elevate the work and collect data um, and look at this on, from a timeline basis. Um, and so as you can see here, uh, that we're really looking at out outputs um, and outcomes. Um, and that we're monitoring our, pro uh, our progress um, and assessing that both at the end of fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23. So this is really um, very timely, uh, Loida and, and, and all of you listening, but it's also an opportunity for us to really measure how we're moving forward and, and what steps we need to take and to resharpen that 
as we go along um, and, and follow the focus. So beginning this fiscal year, um, the American Library Association is going to adopt a maximum three-year cycle for comprehensive EDI training and education for all staff. That has not been done before. We've had, uh, like many of you, you know, we've done periodic trainings, but not an intensive um, cycle. That means that the education and training um, and staff development that we share with our own ALA internal staff, not only will be system-wide, which means all staff will participate. It's not just for our supervisors. It's not just for our managers and leaders. It's not just for middle management, it's for everyone. Um, and especially our frontline staff who actually make some key decisions working with us on programs and, um, and working with our 50,000 plus members to really um, focus on uh, some strong diversity outcomes. And of course the training will not be will be a wide range. Um, so anything I'm sure from microaggressions and what does that mean to, um, to, um, uh, to bias and, and everything in between um, and to have those hard conversations as a staff. Um, number two, in, in fiscal year 22, we've already begun to implement a policy to ensure the inclusion of black indigenous people of color and or individual dis with disabilities in the candidate pool for posted ALA positions. So that means that every position that we have available um, <clears throat> at all levels will be um, promoted and recruitment will be maintained to make sure that we have as diverse a pool, a candidate pool as possible. And that means that we look and elevate that work and make sure that it's done with intentionality. Um, and it also means that we actually spend quite a bit of time um, looking at that pool as it grows and develops and, and uh, creating some changes as we need to in order to create as, as broad um, uh, a call as possible. Um, so in keeping with these efforts, number three, um, the American Library Association has, we've just announced that will hire our first accessibility officer by the end of fiscal year 22. And it's already in play right now. I know that the job description is done and we're starting and mounting the, um, the process for getting the word out uh, very soon. Uh, but keep, um, keep an eye on that because for us, it's been, and, and for many of you, uh, maybe um, you already have accessibility officers and bravo to you, but we have not made that leap at the association level, but this will enable um, our, our members actually to have stronger access um, and knowledge base and, an, and um, a leader in the field to be able to support our own work internally as members around accessibility and different abilities. Next slide, please. So um, of the, this, is, um, this, com this slide completes our um, our seven step process within the fiscal year, fiscal uh, year 22, 23 area. Um, so one of the things that we do is accredit um, library and information uh, uh, science, oops, um, oops, sorry, that's okay, programs. Um, so we have done something a little bit different. I know all of you are used to working with partners. Um, ALA2 is, is uh, uh, beginning to make that really part of our framework of working better together. And that working with our Office for Accreditation, which um, evaluates and accredits those LIS programs, um, um, our committee, um, so that is our member-driven led um, uh, committee that accompanies that office, that does the evaluation of those LIS programs. And Elise, um, which as you know, is, is, our, is our largest library and information service agents um, organization of associations. Um, our executive board has directed our executive office, um, Tracy Hall and her team, to support the introduction of EDI as one of the metrics in accreditation review process by the end of fiscal year 23. So our board actually um, advised and, and in keeping with our commitment to EDI within the entire association, we asked specifically that um, equity, diversity, and inclusion be included as one of the metrics following um, curriculum, uh, faculty, and student composition uh, with, with our framework. Um, and so um, our Committee on Accreditation and our Office of, of Accreditation and Elise are working together um, to ensure that that takes place. Number five, the American Library Association 
Um, we'll also launch the Institute for the Study of Race um, in Libraries and Information Technologies, our lit, as part of the Center for the Future of Libraries in fiscal year 22. Um, this, will work, this work will be carried out by a designated center scholar to be announced this spring. And with that, um, the rotation and bringing in um, different subject matter experts who will assist on a rotation basis um, to this work. Um, so we've elevated not only um, the practice of including EDI, but the research function um, of and how EDI is, um, is part of the American framework in terms of library service. And what does that really mean? What does that look like? What kind of data sets are, are we going to be examining um, uh, in the execution and implementation and um, the evaluation and impact um, and outcomes of this work? Um, and, and finally, um, this last one, by the year of, uh, by the end of the year, fiscal uh, year 2023, the American Library Association will launch a one-year residency program to serve as an ALA workforce pipeline for early to mid-career LIS and association professionals interested in LIS and or association management. What we found is that um, there are so many opportunities um, as an association to really think about how to grow our own, how to make sure that we can elevate the message and the meaning um, by um, introducing um, younger professionals like all of you um, in, this, in this wonderful group um, to think about association work. You know, oftentimes we come to association work after we've been long in the field about LIS. And this is actually to um, elevate that association work as an entry point. Um, uh, to foster the EDI work from the ground up and to infill um, opportunities for our younger professionals to seek association work um, and those that are interested in, um, in LIS uh, professions as well. Um, other internships at the post-secondary level are also in consideration. So we're very excited about this association focused internal reflection about how we can bring EDI uh, um, to, to, to um, a higher level within our association. Um, next slide. And so this last slide as, as we're bringing it up is, is what I wanted to share is all of the external, some an example, excuse me. It's not a comprehensive list of some of the great um, EDI elevated programs that we have within the association. Um, and this is actually um, a really short, small list. We've done um, what we call, um, an EDI audit of all of our programs throughout the association. And it is probably 17 pages long, very fine uh, font. So there's hundreds of, of EDI programs that all of our offices and our roundtables and our divisions and governing body um, efforts are, are underway around EDI. But here are a few. Um, libraries transforming communities. Uh, we are issuing this November seven million dollars in grants to small and rural libraries um, to support accessibility, um, and that would mean um, uh, there around. I think they're going to be around ten to twenty thousand dollars of funding um, to support um, the analysis of the community in terms of your accessibility needs to work in partnership with that community and to implement programs that would directly uh, benefit that particular community around accessibility. So um, examples of these in the past have been services to deaf community, services to older adults, um, uh, re-careering, especially um, during the COVID environment um, to support individuals who needed uh, more um, job and marketing skills. Um, all of those things are, are and, and, and we have been able to fund many of them through several um, um, other grant processes. But this is a, a really wonderful three-year granting program where we will absolutely see some strong outcomes. Um, we've all talked about Spectrum before. Um, it is one of our um, really fantastic programs dedicated to bringing um, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color into the library profession. Um, and now we've been able to regenerate another doctoral fellow of color. Um, we have eight 
um, and that will support them through their entire doctoral program. Um, so it's a really wonderful experience and uh, Dr. Nicole Cook is, is leading that for us. Um, our Emerging Leaders Program continues to offer um, uh, up to 50 leaders every year um, across the country opportunities to explore their leadership, to deepen their leadership. It is meant for um, uh, newer and middle level um, uh, professionals who are seeking advancement in and leadership opportunities and develop and hone those skills from colleagues across the country. And it's just been a marvelous way to deepen the bench and support our, our, um, our younger professionals. Uh, mentoring throughout the American Library Association. All of our, um, the new members roundtable, our international relations roundtable, they all now have supported members from across the country, um, but especially members that are interested in um, and, and that are, um, that are uh, black indigenous and people of color. Um, and all of those, um, and a lot of, of our individuals um, members who really um, have not had the coaching and mentoring experience um, that, they, that they'd so really do need in order to advance. Um, it is also another um, uh, uh, area um, where we can actually help individuals um, to, to really, uh, get rid and blow up that ceiling. And so there is areas um, of, uh, for advancement and, and support um, in whatever goals they choose for themselves. Um, and lastly, the, the last thing I wanted to share because it, it is an underserved population that uh, we all have in our communities, uh, but not often spoken about is um, we are updating within ALA right now, services to incarcerated and detained populations. Um, it is a report and a process that we have not reviewed in 30 years. So we have an opportunity under our great leadership of Tracy Holler, executive director. Um, uh, there's uh, several groups of us meeting together um, to focus on um, uh, uh, young people that are in that car in, in, that are in youth authority um, situations, um, uh, um, those that are currently detained um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and, uh, and, and that includes those um, services um, that are uh, for our, um, our, our, our populations um, that really do not have this, the same kind of resources. Um, and so we're looking at people from all um, ends of the spectrum who are detained or incarcerated for a variety of reasons and the services that they are entitled to have and the right to service. Um, so we're, these are great examples, I think, of programs that um, highlight um, the association work, both internally and externally. And once again, I thank um, Loida for inviting the American Library Association and myself to join you this morning. Um, and thank you, Magda, for advancing the slides and helping with all of this work. Um, thank and that's you what so I much, Patty. Mm -hmm. um, this is very valuable information. We are hoping to uh, motivate and also help our colleagues from around the world to gather uh, more information for them to replicate, adapt, and create their own programs. Um, now we would like to welcome Susan Kyle from Canada. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just share my screen here. Uh, hopefully you can see it now. Um, uh, can you see my screen? My presentation? Yes. yes. Lovely. Thank you very much. So before I begin, uh, I would like to share my acknowledgement of the land in which I'm speaking to you today. I acknowledge that the lands in which I'm speaking to you are situated in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups. And I acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Biafic, the Mi'kmaq, Inuit, and Innu of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. We all strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of our province and we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So thank you. Thank you for the pleasure of uh, joining you today. It's such an incredible group from across uh, the world uh, to come together um, at a very timely uh, way to talk about um, EDI 
and uh, leadership development. And uh, I was pleased to uh, listen to Patty talk about inside the organization of ALA and outside the organization and the services that they are offering around EDI and leadership development. And I am here representing uh, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, a much smaller organization uh, than ALA. Uh, but we have been um, working on services and programs for our members that um, are impactful and important important uh, for academic librarians as well as the academic libraries in which they work. And within the context of Canada, EDI and um, reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples uh, are very important priorities for us. And Carl um, acknowledges that and recognizes the importance of um, both of these areas. Uh, and I'm pleased to be able to speak to you today about what we are working on. So uh, just let me get over to my screen here so I can uh, move it. So just uh, to sort of give you a little bit of uh, an idea about the size of CARL, uh, as opposed to something like the American Library Association, which is a very large um, association, uh, we are comprised of 29 of the larger Canadian university libraries and two federal government libraries um, working on research. So we are important, but we are not necessarily as big as uh, ALA. So first I'd like to talk about the equity, diverse, diversity and inclusion initiatives that we are working on with CARL. Uh, we formed an equity, diversity and inclusion working group uh, back in 2019, just before the pandemic. Um, this is chaired uh, by uh, Lisa O'Hara from the University of Manitoba. And we have a visiting program officer responsible for EDI, uh, Victoria Ho, um, who is working uh, with this committee to shape CARL's EDI related initiatives and, um, and programs. And so we are looking at uh, the four areas uh, that I have listed here that are important for EDI. Recruitment, um, how we can uh, support our members, uh, expanding the pools of individuals working in their organizations from diverse backgrounds, um, how can we retain these individuals? So how can we support our libraries, our Carl libraries to create welcoming environments to um, support ongoing retention of staff from diverse backgrounds? Also, especially important is staff learning. And so Carl has a role in, a, in, a, uh, in the opportunity to help facilitate educational opportunities to better prepare staff to support a diverse workforce and um, as well as a diverse student population within our respective institutions. And then also what does successful practices for creating welcoming and inclusive, inclusive space, uh, space and services in research libraries look like? So these are the four areas that we have been uh, looking at and this is what we have created thus far. So Carl uh, started um, uh, and developed uh, definitions for equity, diversity, inclusion. So that was a benchmark so that we all knew um, uh, what the definitions that we were working from so that we were all on the same page. And we also published strategies and practices for hiring and retaining diverse talent. So this is a very useful and practical uh, document um, uh, that uh, our members can use to um, help uh, move their organizations to more diverse um, uh, complement. And uh, it's a very practical um, document. And uh, I believe you can get it from our CARL website if you are interested in it. This uh, working group also advises on a number of CARL projects. So it brings the EDI lens into our um, initiatives to all the other initiatives that we are looking at, including um, our code of conduct, for example, and a document that has just uh, recently been finished prior to the pandemic, uh, competencies for librarians in Canadian research uh, libraries. So their input into these initiatives and into these um, um, uh, deliverables is incredibly important, as you can imagine, and um, um, this working group is busy to um, working with these uh, different areas of the organization. As part of training and supporting our members, it is always important to come up with uh, um, uh, ways to educate and to promote um, different perspectives. And so uh, this group also um, is organizing a series of webinars and such, which we appreciate. 
I would like to land on one thing that we have been working on, which I think you'll find very interesting, uh, that Carl has been working on a national diversity and inclusion study um, of and for its members. And so uh, last year in the spring, Carl partnered with the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion uh, to promote diversity, to come up with a uh, survey to go out to the members uh, with ultimately the in intent of um, uh, conducting a diversity and inclusion study uh, that will be presented to the members uh, next month, actually. Um, so the idea is to gather baseline data around the composition of personnel in Carl libraries to gauge feedback uh, from employees on current EDI initiatives and to establish a set of benchmarks to evaluate and measure the impact of Carl's library strategies and practices with respect to diversity and inclusion. So the survey results, which will be very rich, as you can imagine, uh, with some important data, will allow Carl Libraries to better understand the lived experience of research library workforce uh, in order to promote diversity and foster inclusive, safe, accessible, equitable, and respectful workplaces. And also to allow um, Carl to develop specific programs, policies, and practices uh, as a result of things that maybe have been highlighted in the survey. And because we're an academic um, association, as you can imagine, we need to measure our progress and uh, our success as a result of this. So there will be a comparable study done in three to five years to see um, uh, where we have come in terms of what we found out through this survey. So quite exciting. Um, uh, and we're interested and excited, as you can imagine, as members of Carl's to get the results, which are now being compiled. So the other thing that I would like to talk to you about is leadership development. Um, I am the visiting program officer for leadership development with Carl. And for the past uh, while, I have been working with um, a third party organization to develop a leadership uh, institute called the Advanced Library Leadership Institute or ALI. And this is designed specifically for our members uh, who are working at the associate university librarian level. Uh, so not the directors or the heads or deans of um, academic libraries, but the associates. Uh, and to assist them in becoming more capable leaders and position to lead Canadian university libraries in the future. So this is a seven day cohort training style program uh, developed as I mentioned by a third party uh, organization. And we were all set to go with this in uh, the spring of 2020. And we were right up to the door, ready to go with it um, when uh, unfortunately the pandemic uh, came and we had to postpone it. But this is going to happen this year in June and um, a maximum of 30 participants are going to participate in this program. So it will be delivered face-to-face um, uh, as we are all doing, in, not only in this webinar, but for the past two years, we have all been participating in remote learning opportunities, which are absolutely uh, fantastic. And we have, um, uh, we have learned how to maximize the impact and the value of remote learning. However, um, in this cohort, we are going with face-to-face -face delivery to, um, because we also recognize that uh, building a community of practice and um, allowing people to gather and have that informal conversation and uh, learning opportunities in a face-to-face -face environment is so rich and so um, beneficial. Uh, and we um, uh, felt very strongly that we'd like to have this face-to-face -face. because this is also um, a very practical uh, week. So uh, the cohort will come together and talk about real life problems, um, and they will uh, and they will be able to uh, work together um, uh, face to face in off time as well as during the the, the class. I'm cognizant that I only have a minute left, so I'm going to pick up my pace a little bit. Uh, the thing we are going to do, um, we are going to encourage plenty of uh, social time and activities to develop, as I mentioned, the community of practice and the community of peers. But we're also going to incorporate uh, policies and initiatives like EDI into the course curriculum, uh, case studies and problem solving activities. So actually, that was all I wanted to say. Um, 
Carl, while uh, not as big as the American Library Association, it is a very rich organization in terms of its ability to respond to the needs of its members. And um, uh, EDI and leadership development are two very important factors in that uh, development. And it was a pleasure to speak to you today about those initiatives. So thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, it's really heartening to um, hear from efforts in different countries uh, towards um, nurturing and growing leaders and also fostering diversity. Uh, and the, the diversity within the library associations is wonderful as well. Um, now, I would like to welcome Maria, Paria, Borna, and Magdalena from the New Professional Special Interest Group who will conduct uh, the interactive sessions and will report. So I hope that everyone joins one of the meeting rooms. Uh, Magdalena. Uh, yes, uh, there is a time uh, for uh, talking and working in uh, groups. I'm just creating breakout rooms. So I will open all rooms now. Okay, and you can see invitation to the room. So please accept it. Okay, I think that we are all here now. So there is a time for uh, a short summary from uh, our discussions. Maybe I can be a volunteer and start. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, we had uh, in, in my room, uh, number four, we had uh, interesting uh, discussion with using uh, sticky notes and uh, also with microphones um, about uh, some um, our librarians from our countries uh, have opportunity uh, to take part in NGOs programs which help to uh, develop uh, their leadership skills. In, uh, they can also lead open science projects and uh, attend in coaching and uh, international mentorship skills. Um, there is interesting example that in Marsilia there is a leadership institute uh, which offer, uh, offers uh, programs for librarians. And a few recommendations from my colleagues, from my group is that um, opportunity um, to, uh, that librarians have opportunity to uh, take part in projects and to lead projects with help from experienced librarians. Um, a very good results could be from attending uh, with mentorship and also train of training. And uh, last thing about the needs, uh, three words, lead, learn and training. So there are three, uh, that there is a few summary from my group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, can I do it now? Uh, we also had a very interesting uh, conversation. It was a very uh, nice group of people. I'm very happy that I participated in this. So um, we also had uh, very nice information that we gather, but we all discussed and decided that this will be a conclusion that uh, good practice is to give award to new professionals to organize different uh, kinds of lessons for free and to learn from peers. Uh, we recommend uh, learning from uh, leaders uh, by job sh shadowing network uh, of open access uh, resources for new professionals and uh, needed skills for new professionals and also for us to be better in our job. Uh, it's it's a project event management, human resources, public speaking, advocacy skills, and similar. So that's all from our group. It's, uh, it's been a very fun time. Thank you all. All right, I can go next. Uh, we were in group two and we had really good discussion and they lead into each other. So practice recommendation and needs sort of uh, really connect to each other. 
uh, some of the practices that we talked about that we are it's already happening in some of our libraries or we see you know happening in other libraries it's that mentorship programs that you know seasoned librarians are mentoring newer librarians or creating opportunities for um you know librarians that uh, to um work with each other internationally. So there was an example of German librarians and uh, uh, librarians from Switzerland working with each other and learning from each other. And what led also into recommendation was succession planning and not wait for people to retire and identify new people when they're ready to lead and help them and support them and coach them. So we have our young leaders in place before our other leaders either retire or leave. Some of the other recommendations were mentoring for new librarians or giving our young colleagues opportunities and more space to try themselves out, um, join association boards. And um, I will also go into meet now. I don't want to run out of time. We did have two um, suggestions for needs, and one of them is more of a suggestion to the new librarians or new leaders it was willingness to fully implicate themselves and then the other one is more specialized leadership training um and that was it for our group uh, we had a really fun discussion um hello to everyone a few uh, closing thoughts and sentences from my group um we share your um thoughts and ideas. Uh, the thing that um, pops out the most during our conversation was the importance of uh, good communication within the library. Um, also uh, mentorship and um, something that was very important was that um, a leader should always uh, be open to the ideas of his staff and should also be able to listen and to support everyone. And thank you. Thank you so much to um, each one of the four leaders of our interactive groups. Um, this information is valuable and it will be compiled for uh, the MLIS program in Dublin. Now we're going to our last section for this webinar. And in this session, we will hear from uh, a citizen and a new librarian and their leadership experiences. We would like to welcome now Dr. Celinda Bird from Canada. Can you see my can you see my screen now? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. So um, I'm going to provide a bit of a kind of a personal um, journey about um, what what leadership um, has looked like for me. Um, before I begin, I do want to um, acknowledge that as we gather on this virtual space, I want to acknowledge that the ground beneath many of us is historically the home of Indigenous peoples who were forced off these lands. The Indigenous people of Turtle Island have experienced in the past and continue experience extreme injustices. I'm presenting from the University of Windsor and I share respectfully the names of the peoples who were first to live, celebrate, reflect, and grow upon the land where I now sit. I live, learn, and listen from the traditional territories of the Three Fires Confederacy, which includes the Jibwa, the Ottawa and the Potawatomi. So I want to begin just um, giving a bit of an overview of what my career path has looked like as an academic librarian. I've been an academic librarian um, for 18 years and my most recent um, position change was in July 1 of last year um, where I became the University Librarian of, at the University of Windsor. One of the things I want to acknowledge and I want to talk about um, later in is, is that um, I am fortunate enough that I've been able to stay at the same institution um, since 2008, so 14 years, and, and been able to hold um, a variety of um, leadership positions, which is quite unique. And I, I'm going to acknowledge that at the end when I talk about um, development and, and, and uh, kind of leadership journeys. In terms of what kind of leadership development I have um, I've had opportunity to access. Um, I just want to 
kind of focus on a few of them here. One is um, when I was at Western University, um, I had the opportunity to take part in a foundation leadership skills program, which was an internal to the university um, program, which allowed me to um, was, you know, for individuals who were aspirational towards leadership, they provided some really basic foundational skills um, through this program. And then following that, I was able to take the Library Skills um, Management Skills Institute um, that is offered um, through, through the US. Um, and uh, again, just reinforcing those management skills. And then the next two opportunities that I think were really important to my leadership development, one was um, actually not so much a development opportunity in relation to a course, but actually an opportunity that was afforded to me by the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, which was the development of of the, the Librarians Research Institute. And this was very, very important to me because it allowed me to have a leadership opportunity without um, a formal role. And I would support associations providing these opportunities as much as possible in order to get exposure to what that looks like in terms of leading um, within the library and within, uh, within librarianship as well. Um, you know, exposing and exposing individual librarians to, to a network of peers outside of their institution. So that was a very important opportunity that was um, was afforded to me um, by the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. So um, I actually developed and deli delivered the Librarians Research Institute, which was um, kind of a key part of developing research culture in Canada. Additionally, I did do my PhD in library and information studies as well. Um, while, while um, a career librarian, and that was also a huge um, development opportunity. Most recently, um, I had the opportunity to, to participate in the University of Manitoba's Center for Ed Higher Education Research and Development, and this was also supported by my institution and, and the associations that I'm involved in. And this was a senior university administrators course. And what was interesting about this is this was not an, um, wasn't focused on librarians, actually. This was, um, an opportunity, um, a, a development opportunities for provosts, presidents, uh, deans, associate deans, um, directors, as well as chief librarians. And so what was interesting about it, it exposed me kind of to the wider sector. What I will say about um, leadership opportunities for myself is that um, I think that the diversity of opportunities um, that I have um, been able to take has been really important. Um, when it's an intern to the organization, it provides an understanding of your local organization as well as a development of a network of peers and colleagues and mentors looking internally to the profession. It gives you an understanding of the profession, where the vision for the profession is and, and helps to develop um, kind of a network within, within the profession. And, and for me, this um, most recent development opportunity, which is actually both external to the organization and the profession has been really important because it has provided me with a greater, um, greater understanding of the wider context of higher education, of academia in general. It has put kind of my, you know, my library centric view in a much bigger picture. And that's been really helpful to me. And it's something that I certainly would encourage leaders of the library to do, whether that's engagement with civic librarianship, with business library, I mean, civic leadership or business leadership, but to also um, come out from the walls of the library to, to kind of actually situate our leadership within um, a larger picture. And this has been really helpful to me even as simple as being able to listen to the language being used, to listen in terms of what budget and planning means, not only for the library, but within this larger sector and this, this larger kind of environment. So for me, I do think that, and I think that Patty Wong spoke about this, is that it, it is about providing a diversity of opportunities. There's no one thing that's going to um, provide leadership development, but we do need this kind of di diversity um, for opportunities. The other thing I'd like to pitch here um, and, and talk about is the idea of leadership development is, is actually a broad responsibility and one that I, I would argue that we all have a role in. And I do um, encourage um, everyone um, to, to kind of create a positive um, culture for leadership um, and, and for the leadership we want in our profession. Um, I believe that the environment that we work with in fosters, encourages and, and uh, kind of brings up about certain kinds of leadership. And I know I recognize this is difficult. Absolutely. Um, there is 
a need for criticism and critique for, for leadership at the same time. Um, I think that we also need to um, be cognizant of, of that kind of negativity in leadership and what the impact of that is. And in particular, um, my concern is, is being able to attract the type of leaders we want in the profession and being able to attract diverse um, leaders. Um, we say, we talk about um, the concept of the dark side in terms of leadership and, and we easily say it, but we don't always recognize that it discourages individuals. Um, the loss of colleagues and community is, is, is a significant deterrent um, to going into leadership. And we need to realize in the context of diversity that when we talk about the dark side and, and kind of leaving colleagues and losing community, for individuals who have lived in a vulnerable state or have been othered their entire life, this idea that we're going to be able to attract them to, to leadership is, is going to be really challenged. And I think that there is value in, in creating a positive culture around leadership and validating leadership aspirations, um, legitimizing them, um, talking to people who want um, to be leaders and, and talking about what it is that we want from leadership? What is that that they bring to leadership that they that we don't want those individuals to lose? Um, because I do worry that um, in the absence of a positive culture for leadership, um, our efforts in, in diversity and and getting um, kind of a more holistic view of leaders um, is is at risk. So um, I would just say that we all have a role in leadership development. And as a profession, um, I think if we want to change leadership, um, we need to all take a role in, in fostering that as much as we can. Um, just really quickly, and I am cognizant of the time, is, is I... I, I in terms of my own um, journey, I, I'm one of the things that I'm very thankful for um, is the valuing of a breadth of experiences and backgrounds. So as I said, um, I am lucky enough that I've spent my um, leadership career at a single institution. And I'm very, very lucky that um, there wasn't one single experience of backgrounds that that committee was looking for. They recognized um, that, that I brought something um, to the organization, even though I was I was within the organization, and uh, I, I am grateful for that. I also think um, very carefully about the qualities that um, I believe that people saw in me, um, and and kind of building off of Barbara Lizon's comments, I think that this idea of leading with integrity, the strategic focus, thinking about what we want, we want people who enjoy building relationships with people who want to understand people, um, people that enjoy assisting in others people's success, that they aren't focused on their own success, and that they there is an aspect of resilience. And I think we need to recognize that those are also transferable qualities for leadership. And so our ability to kind of take on diverse hiring practices and, and kind of expanding our breadth of experience that we're looking for actually will increase the diversity um, within leadership. And, and to kind of put a very personal sense in this is that I don't have uh, an ability to, to move cities. I am um, a single lesbian mom who is responsible, for, uh, who cares and, uh, and is the parent of, of a, a child with some high needs and, and I don't have the ability to move. And so I, I am very, very grateful that that um, my institution saw something in me as an internal candidate um, that was able to to provide leadership for for the for the library. So, I think that um, the more we see leaders as whole people, um, um, right from leadership development right through the career, I think there's um, some real value to the profession and and being able to. Um, to build a very strong leadership force. And finally, I think um, I would just say as everyone goes through their um, professional and leadership career, um, I encourage gratitude for the opportunities. We are very lucky to be in this profession. Um, we, you know, many of us work in very, very positive environments. And uh, for that, I think there is um, a place for gratitude. And that was it. Thank you, Thank you so much, Dr. Berg. Um, we have had wonderful speakers, and I was really um, uh, touched by uh, something you said about validating people's experiences and, and leading with integrity and enjoy assisting others on their journey to success. So uh, we appreciate your uh, inspiring words. Uh, thank you so much.
And now we continue with um, welcoming Crystal Cheng. And she's our last but not least important uh, speaker today. She's coming from New York. Um, thank you. Let me see if I can present, which I think I'm doing. Yes, we see your presentation. Excellent. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today. And thank you to Lloyda for inviting me. I'm going to give a short presentation focused on my experience with ALA's Emerging Leaders Program and a little on the four years since, in the hopes that it'll help other library workers further develop their own leadership pathways and to emphasize the necessity of organizational support for underrepresented library workers. Some background information about me. I am currently a teen center coordinator at the New York Public Library, working centrally to provide support to our many branches. I transitioned into this job last year from a branch library role in the hopes of being a part of a larger wave of change. I have over 10 years of library experience, including eight at NYPL. In my spare time, I serve as a community administrator for We Hear, a supportive community for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, or BIPOC, working in the library and information field. I am also involved in the American Library Association, particularly uh, with its youth division, YALSA, and with the Chinese American Librarians Association, CALA, and the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association, Apollo. My professional development over the last five years has, in, in many ways, stemmed from my first significant interaction with ALA through its Emerging Leaders Program, which I'll talk about more in this presentation. Um, but first, I want to take a moment to grapple with the idea of leadership and what that really means. Uh, when Lloyda first invited me to join this webinar, I had a lot of hesitation because I don't in many ways identify myself as a leader. Even though I've led or co-led several projects, chaired multiple committees, I've always considered myself more as a facilitator than anything else, someone who's helping to clear the pathway to make it easier uh, for a team to collectively complete their work. And I think the reason I struggle with the idea of leaders or leadership is because it can often be tied into traditional ideas of hierarchical leadership, where you're at the top of this pyramid with many people under you and reporting to you. It also implies a kind of power, sometimes over others, that gives me a bit of discomfort as well, because I think we've all uh, seen how power can be abused. Um, but then when I think about uh, those who I consider leaders in the library field, I realized that those people were people like Ray Pun, like Lloyd, like Patty, people who are constantly opening the door for others. Rather than keeping people out, they are welcoming people in and uplifting those around them, creating meaningful change that makes the library field more equitable. And that's the kind of leadership I strive toward, one that opens doors and that empowers and uplifts those within my community. So I was part of the Emerging Leaders class of 2018, along with NYPL colleagues, Caitlin Frick and AJ Mohammed. Uh, the program starts in January and culminates in the poster session June during ALA's annual conference. At the start of the program, we're assigned a project and over the course of four months, we work virtually in small teams to bring it to fruition. Um, although there are many people who work hard to make the Emerging Leaders program happen every year, I must especially acknowledge and thank Beatrice Calvin, who guided us, who often had to wrangle us, and we were quite a large group of 50 people, and was always there to answer every question and provide support. Our project, Daily Pathways, was sponsored by PLA, the Public Library Association, and consisted of creating a resource, a resource guide for public library staff to gain the skills necessary for working with library assessment data. Our project team include myself, Tracy Drake, Aurelia Mandani, AJ Mohammed, and Claire Nickerson. Samantha Lopez and Stacey Aldrich served as our ALA liaisons and guided us throughout the project. So I won't speak too much on the project itself, but there is a PLA webinar on it and more information can be found at this website Aurelia created and in this poster that Claire designed. But what I will talk about is how pivotal the Emerging Leaders experience was. It was my first experience collaborating with library workers across the nation over a prolonged period, and I learned valuable skills that have helped me advance in my career. So some of those skills are project management. We developed a variety of strategies, including a timeline and task system to stay on track while still being able to engage in the social aspects of teamwork. We also learned important facilitation and communication skills, like the importance of creating action items and debriefing at the end of meetings, ensuring that before we left, we were always on the same page. I also learned the necessity of trust and respect when it comes to collaboration. That meant trusting in the abilities of my teammates, trusting, respecting their strengths and skills, and working together to collectively overcome any weaknesses. I had to learn when to step up and when to step back to let others lead. 
Emerging um, Leaders was also one of the first times I found myself speaking in front of a large audience outside of a classroom setting. Public speaking was something that five years ago I really struggled with, and the advice given to me to overcome that fear was to keep engaging with it, which of course was really hard um, to have to constantly face that fear. But Emerging Leaders allowed me to really dip my toe into public speaking. The poster session ALA annual led to the aforementioned PLA webinar and a presentation from the PLA executive board. And from there, I felt really empowered to tackle other topics. In 2019, alongside colleagues Katrina Ortega and Maggie Craig, I presented at the Next Library Conference at Doc One in Denmark. In many ways, a petrifying public speaking experience, but one that I would not have uh, felt capable of doing if not for emerging leaders. After the Emerging Leaders Program, I became more involved in the National Associations of Librarians of Color, or NALCO. Uh, CALA, in particular, sponsored my participation in Emerging Leaders and also provided grants for school and travel to conferences. CALA was essential to the growth of my career. I also became a lifetime member for both associations during the COVID pandemic, as it became increasingly clear that associations like CALA and Apala were vital in the face of the rise in anti-Asian hate and attacks in America. It was meaningful to see these associations work together in solidarity alongside Reforma, BCALA, and AILA to combat racism and to advocate for the well-being, safety, and humanity of its BIPOC members. So these next few slides, I want to just quickly highlight a couple of committees I'm proud to have worked on, including the Apollo Young Adult Literature Awards subcommittee with Jen Wu, Danilo Balin, Tamiko Welch, and Anna Coates. This was a photo taken at one of our last discussion meetings. Ben Basco was our liaison and one of our committee chairs, along with Helen Look and Dora Ho. Having worked on many different committees, I found a particular joy and camaraderie in book evaluation committees. And it's a reminder that you may have to try a bunch of different things to find the thing that really is right for you. I'm also co-leading with Melody Lung, the Cala Yalsa Task Force, which is working in collaboration with ALS to create a series of Chinese American book lists and author talks to celebrate Cala's 50th anniversary next year. This is the poster I created for last year's Reforma Conference. Our task force follows in the footsteps of other collaborations by NALCO, including many spearheaded by BCL ALA under President Shante Burns Simpson. Um, in the bottom right of the poster, you can see a list of names of people who were involved in the creation of this task force. I named them intentionally, as I've named many people during this presentation, um, not to name drop, but to recognize the work and labor of all those around me. I think it's important to remember that we don't exist in a vacuum, that our labor builds upon and is supported by the labor of others, and to acknowledge that. Because in librarianship and in many other fields, when you are part of an underrepresented community, your labor can often go unrecognized and sometimes even exploited. So in this tiny way, I try to push back against that. I also want to briefly highlight We Here, a supportive community for BIPOC and LIS founded by Jennifer Ferretti. The other admins include Jennifer Brown, Charlotte Rowe, Nicolette Davis, and myself. I bring up We Here as a reminder that community and support can look very different for different people and that they can also live and thrive outside of formal institutions and associations. And lastly, I'll end on the slide that shows some of the programs I've done over the years as a library worker at NYPL, whether I was working as an assistant, a trainee, a librarian, or now a coordinator. Um, everyone's leadership uh, leadership path is different. Sometimes it's slower, sometimes it winds and pauses, and sometimes it speeds by so quickly you hardly realize. But whatever that path takes, I think it's important to look for ways to enact meaningful change, to value and advocate for yourself and others, even when society says otherwise, and to always, as Congressman John Lewis once said, make good trouble. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation and leadership journey. If you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me in my email, which is at crystalchen at nypl.org. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Crystal, for sharing your path to leadership. Uh, that was very interesting. You quoted John Lewis, right? Getting in good trouble. We all want that good trouble. <laughs> um, I would like to ask uh, if we can have the last slide on the screen. We are closing our webinar for today. And I would like to thank our speakers and also thanks to each one of you participants that stayed uh, for the duration of the webinar that took a little bit longer than anticipated. Um, we have so much information to consider related to leadership and to fostering diversity. Um, excellent examples from uh, two countries in North America. 
And um, we, we, I would like to see if we can have the last uh, slide on the screen because it has a very interesting information for all of us. Um, we are going to compile all this information from the interactive groups as well and from the speakers um, to support MLIS program at the ITA conference uh, in Dublin this summer. So thank you so much to all for joining us today. I cannot see the last slide on the screen, but what it says is that we will see you at the next webinar on April 7 at 9 a.m. New York time and 3 p.m. Amsterdam time. And that webinar is going to feature the European region. So we are all very excited about that and looking forward, we have uh, excellent speakers as well, representing different library associations in the region. And uh, we have very dedicated members from MLAS working on that uh, event as well. So thank you so much, everyone. And we will see you next time.